Good people, did you know that there are folks who don't apply for jobs? Don't even look for business opportunities. Opportunities just come to them. They are on the headhunters list. How do you get yourself on the headhunters list? Well, we'll be telling you that and a lot more only on the headhunter show. Greetings everyone. Welcome to a premiere episode of The Headhunter with me, Laban Cliff. Coming to you only on KT, and it's always a pleasure to have you on board and always want to hear your feedback on The Headhunter. This is a thought leadership program. The gentleman that I'm about to introduce to you is a good friend of mine and an inspirational thought leader, a man I've known over the years based off on his journey and how to become, of course, one of the thought leaders and HR gurus in Kenya and the region. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause to Paul Casimo. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for Be inviting me. Over. Before we even go further, yeah. take a look at Paul Casimo's profile. Don't forget, we're coming to you from a Kofisi offices. Of course, these are our partners in this Headhunter program. Amazing space right here. And of course, cutting edge, going into the future of work, which is, of course, you know, choose to work from home, choose to work in uh, virtual spaces. What do you think, Paul? For you, how are you seeing it at Safaricom? I think the starting point was uh, before COVID, I think we had the issue of should people work remotely? COVID came and accelerated the fourth industrial revolution which then meant you needed to reimagine work. And what we've seen is that uh, both work, workplace and workforce has had to change. So specifically on the workplace, now you're seeing, um, I mean, at one point, because of COVID, everybody was working remotely, working from home. Now it's about working from anywhere. And the bigger piece was around well-being of, uh, of your people. So that way then meant ensure people don't get infected and then there was a bit of how do you ensure they're engaged and how do you ensure they are collaborating because if you have a team of 6,000 for instance what we have in Safaricom it means then it's also a case of saying what tools do you put in place to ensure a collaborative workforce but then the bigger issue was how do you ensure people are productive so that became another bigger conversation and so far I think we're seeing more and more companies of course, benchmarking, again, is what Safaricom is doing. But there's also the bit about, you know, if I'm not seeing my employee, you know, in the vicinity, then they're not working. I think there has been a real paradigm shift on how you lead, how you manage, but most importantly, what is, what is an employee supposed to do? Uh, the bigger piece was, how do you still ensure you deliver to your customers? Because that's a, the end game. How do you ensure you deliver to your customers remotely, collaboratively, and how do you enable each other person to deliver? Uh, the bigger piece is what are you managing as a line manager? Are you managing activity? Are you managing an outcome? And therefore, uh, contracting has had to be reimagined. And, and therefore, uh, looking at the, what we are now witnessing, people have had to kind of strike a balance between what you would call a hybrid working on-site, off-site, based on the job that you're doing, and also the need to build a common culture because you also don't want everybody to be out there and you say, these are my employees. So how was your experience in the banking sector compared to what we're seeing now, and especially managing people uh, in your time at Botswana? I still wear the lens around work. How was work like then? And obviously it was a case of you come to the office, you go to the bank. Uh, there was, at that time, there was less of remote banking. You had to be physically in the office. So the bigger piece, we were looking at branch network. The more branches you had, the, more, uh, the bigger you are. In fact, at one time, Barclays used to advertise that a big world needs a big bank. When we were looking at talent at that time, and I was responsible for the management trainee program, we were hiring people who would be good at fast counting money because it had to be, you must balance your, your till at the end of the day. We were looking at uh, people who could still smile. We were looking at uh, people who could work collaboratively. So there are some elements that have not changed. But then you discover that the banker became a different uh, profile. So people were looking for uh, an interaction where you don't, I, I'm not just coming for money. I want somebody who can advise me on wealth management. I want someone to tell me how do I build the right 
savings culture, but most importantly, how do I invest? At the time, the bigger piece with the banks was purely just transactions. Now that has changed. Uh, again, now you find more online banking, more products that are very futuristic. Come uh, Kenya Airways, the bigger piece there was... Before Kenya Airways, quick yeah. one on that. Yeah. And, I, and, and this is, um, and I know it will be like, uh, you know, a piece of meat for MBA uh, holders and of course students. What are some of the key lessons we learn from your experience in the banking sector at the time? And here I want to draw in the speed of change. Do you feel like Barclays was slow to get into the SME market? And maybe perhaps what would have been the people factor that led into this? I think uh, banking was, they used to say a bank was a bank. And what it meant then, you had products, very specific. You were either a retail banker or a corporate banker. That was it. So in terms of when you say innovation, uh, the products were kind of standard. Now, if you look at what it has now become, you're looking of, do you have any innovation hub? How are your products being reimagined? I don't think that was the case. There was one standard product, take it or leave it. When you applied for a, a loan, it, there was a KYC, before even KYC, but the, no, your customer was, you need to have stayed in a certain address for this time. If your income is this, forget it. And they would even say, this is the minimum uh, threshold of income that you should have to open an account with us. At that time, people are looked very specifically in a, in a siloed kind of manner. That has changed dramatically. Now, you don't know who your, your, your customer is. Yeah. And in fact, now, people, banks are looking for customers, while the other time, people would beg to open an account. So you go into a bank and you're told, no, we don't want to open an account with you. Today, I, I wouldn't imagine that is not the case anymore. One key takeaway for people managers in the banking industry? A big one is when you recruit uh, talent. First, look for the kind of mindset that comes with reimagining and, and developing this, not bespoke, but actually just reimagining the customer and engaging with individuals as an entirety, as a, as a universe. Problem is, when you look at uh, customers today, anybody working in a bank will have to engage at a personal level, not at a product level. And I think that's a big, big shift in mindset. Wow, that's great insights. Kenya Airways, here goes. So I go to uh, Kenya Airways, and the bigger conversation then was, how do you reimagine the workforce 10 years up front? Because then you will say, you have a 10-year fleet plan. You would order a plane that will take another maybe three years for it, because of the queue, and because of the customization, for it to come through. So you'll know in three years, you'll have a white body. As HR, then you'll say, how many pilots do you require? How many cabin crew do you require? And how do you start training now ahead of that plane coming in? So I think the longer term lens was bigger. Talking of uh, the lens you'd wear, it wasn't the here and now. It was more of saying, if you don't make a decision now, you'll be punished five years from, from now. So that meant we started with our ab initial process. When I joined, uh, I found, uh, this was 2006, I found 140 pilots. By the time I was leaving in 2011, we had over 400 pilots. And the way we did that was looking at the ab initial program. So we partnered with the bank. We provided uh, scholarships for um, young chaps who could not afford uh, flying to go for uh, training in, uh, in South Africa at the time. And therefore, as a result, we build a clear pipeline for our talent. I think there was a bit about the engineers. That was another bigger piece, because you are still competing with uh, some very deep-pocketed uh, airlines for talent. And then you would ensure that they are certified. But then ultimately, we said, and this was my last uh, project uh, at Kenya, is how do we establish a flight simulator where we can also train our pilots? And actually, the payback was about two, uh, two years, nine months payback for that simulator. Just because if you look at the cost of taking a pilot out of the country, they will lay over for a couple of days, the training, everything. So it became a case of now looking at uh, the business in totality, long-term lens, 
but also broadly around workforce planning and asking yourself, how do you prepare for the future? Having been there and having you know, seen the systems and operations, maybe a, an advice one or two. The airline industry is, is complicated and is unforgiving. One thing I find is that everybody seems to have a view on how to run an airline. But there are a lot of dynamics in there. Because if you look at a balance sheet of an airline, Yes, there is a revenue that you make, and it's, it's good revenue. At one time, you may find it, sales per week, KQ would be like two billion shillings. But then there are some costs that sit in there that are heavy. So there's a fleet cost, there's a bit around uh, overheads, there is financing costs. And the decisions you make today may not be visible immediately. They will show up about three years later. For instance, the choice of the aircraft you go for, the choice of um, uh, the training or lack of training. So the longer term view in an airline told me that some of the bits that you look at are things that are not happening now. They happened five years back. But also the industry is very unforgiving because it's one where the margins are very low. So it's, it's one where you, you work for others suppliers, when you pack an aircraft, you pay for it. When you fly, you obviously are burning fuel. When you land, you pay somebody else. So the costs are big. But then you need to look at an airline beyond the profit and loss and say, what role does it play in the economy? We prided in saying, um, KQ opened the world to Kenyans. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you don't get this anywhere else, only on The Headhunter. We're going to take a break right now, but stay tuned for we'll be back. Welcome back to The Headhunter with me, Laban Cliff, coming to you from Kofisi, Africa. We still continue the conversation with the HR guru, one man who, of course, you look online and you say, this is somebody I need to hear from and I need to listen to based off on his experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Kasimo from Kenya and around Africa, a man you need to know. Thank you so much for being with us. No, thank you, Laban, for the invite. Spoken about Barclays. Spoken about your experience at Kenya Airways, quite emotional, I must say. Um, and now, after all that, you go and sell beer. How, how did that happen? So, some of my haters say that I, I came from flying high to being high, which was, <laughs> which, which was, which was fine, and uh, <laughs> I, 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 I loved it. From flying high to being high. To being, yeah. From <laughs> flying to being <laughs> yeah. high, which, which, was, which was fantastic. And yeah. actually, there were moments when yeah. uh, we yeah. did the blind tasting of uh, yeah. some of the Tusker lights yes. uh, as we were doing from concept to shelf in three months. Yeah. So I, I guess they were right yeah. to a certain extent. The Kenya Airways piece was, was heavy from... So every organization I've worked for has what I would call the, the real pressing need from a human resource point of view. Barclays was more of just skilling, ensuring you develop talent, you develop leadership, and you grow. Kenya Airways was around manpower planning, how you forecast engineers, cabin crew, obviously pilots, and how you ensure you deliver. But there was a bigger piece about employee relations at Kenya Airways, because at one time I had about three unions uh, I had the Kalpa, I had uh, Au, I had uh, Tau, I had, uh, I had uh, an air, um, Did that turn into a lobbyist? Yes, I, <laughs> I, I, had, uh, yeah. I had another union in South Africa. Yeah. We had a Kuru Center in, uh, in Douala, one in, uh, in, the Euro, in Europe, one in Bangkok. So it was, employee relations was a big one. And especially then when you find the role of a line manager. And it was a big one for me 
while we set up and I look back and I say, what a run. Five years, uh, great uh, learnings, great friends. But then I realized that while you can have the best policies, if you don't have an amazing line manager, you lose the soul of an organization. And when I went to um, EABL, Diageo, my, my main focus was how do I make every person who has a people responsibility an amazing line manager? And I had amazing uh, bosses. And in there we started saying, how do we build the capability of line managers? How do we build or change the mindset of the role of a line manager to be an enabler, to be somebody who believes and empowers their teams, but most importantly, a human being? What we did there, we had about three, no, four main businesses. So there was Kenya Breweries, which, which was contributing up to even 80% of East African breweries' uh, uh, revenue. We had uh, Serengeti Breweries in Tanzania. We had Uganda Breweries. And we had what we called uh, East African Breweries Limited International, which covered Rwanda, Burundi, part of DRC, and Southern Sudan. And it was a case of saying, I think we, we, we declared that we wanted to be known as a talent builder, where great talent come from, and also a net exporter of talent. And therefore, the bigger conversation there was, how do you build capabilities for your high potentials to then grow and conquer the world as it were? So that was a bigger conversation. And the one thing I look back and feel really excited about was, that amazing people manager. And it had two aspects. It was how do you build capabilities for your leaders to balance the here and now and the future? It's not either or, it is and. So deliver today and deliver the future. So there, you must make that balance. And the second piece is around how do you empower and also kind of demand, if, it, if I would put it that way. So you, you are demanding on the one hand of your people, but you're also inspiring them to be. So that balance, I think, was what we looked at. And the bigger piece was self-awareness was the first story, I mean, first step of that journey. So we, we said, let's provide insights to our leaders to understand what their, their leadership impact is, and then also know their spike. What is your spike? What is the one thing that makes you Laban? The converse, what is your barrier as a leader? Because sometimes your spike could be your, your barrier in terms of how you inspire and bring out the best in your teams. And then when we did that, we went through what we call breakthrough performance coaching. And we, any leader who came at a certain level had a coach, had the insight of their profile, and then we worked with them. Nobody's a finished product. And, and also, uh, one of the learnings I've had in time is they're leaders for different seasons. You might be amazing today in, a, in one organization and actually fail in another. Or you might be in the same organization, be relevant up to a certain point, and you stop being relevant. So I think we, we say let's, let's work with our people and build them to be the best they can be. So that was the biggest piece at um, EABL. I think what was exciting at one time was the number of leaders we had exported across Africa and actually beyond. And it said, my belief about talent is everybody has potential. Uh, sometimes we look at what is missing in people rather than what exists and then build on that. Although the, the converse is also true. Talent like milk has a shelf life. And if you don't convert it into something else, either cheese or something, then you can only have it for this long. Yeah. Which then means, how do you continue building, reimagining talent? And even as an individual where you say, how do I grow? I, I, I actually, as a coach, because at one time I had to say I want to, I worked with amazing coaches. And uh, around, um, after three years at EABL, I went for my executive coaching diploma. And I believe that sometimes what I find very tragic is how people get labeled. And once you are labeled, 
They say, give a dog a bad name and hang it. I've seen people who are amazing under certain line managers becoming uh, mediocre or even non-performers. So I think what we did was how do we provide uh, that environment for talent to be? And that's what we did at uh, EABL where our trainees came in. We spoke of the 70-20-10 of development. That 70% of your development as talent comes from the jobs you do. So we structured jobs in ways that it exposed our talent at a young age. That meant uh, giving them functional uh, exposure, but also cross-border for those who, who came out um, as real top talent. And I think that is where we discovered the 70% of the jobs that people do, it is the jobs you did in the past that have made you who you are today, whether planned or unplanned. 20% uh, comes of your development comes from yeah. your mentors and coaches. And I'll tell you, most of us are products of people who, who took a bet on us. Yeah. And they saw something in us even when we didn't see anything in us. And I think that came through in my mid-30s when I was asked to go and run HR in Botswana. And I was like, I've never run HR on my own. How can this be? And that's a story for another day. Yeah. And then 10% is what you call structured learning. Mm -hmm. And I think when you balance that, then you bring the best in your people. So the power of having coaches, and I say this, the def default position of a line manager should be that of a coach. Every interaction should be a coaching moment. Most leaders don't know the difference between coaching and telling. And when you tell, then you're perhaps giving somebody at best uh, a piece of fish, if not the whole fish. But when you coach, you start helping people to know how to fish and how to deal with different situations. And, and, and it's, it's, it's so important for people to get those guys, mentors, coaches, who can take a bet on you. And I'm saying so, that because, you know, it's always like, you know, I'm the best MBA holder. I'm the best in, in my school. So I feel I deserve the job, but you don't have somebody who can take a bet on you. Cause, and it's actually tragic uh, in most organizations where yeah. sometimes you find People will ignore the talent they have internally. And, and um, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. <laughs> and go external no names, yes. to bring uh, talent Talents, because yeah. they believe um, uh, fresh thinking, fresh thinking yeah. and the like. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you have, you have a gem in, in, yes, your, in exactly. your team. And most people, talent have realized the only way to go up is to go out. Which is tragic because yeah. when you then have clear ways of identifying talent and yeah. growing them, yeah. then you can still get the best of your, your high potential yeah. talent. Paul Casimo, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Pleasure, yeah. And to many more, he's not told us about the news we're gonna break on the headhunter, but we're gonna call him back of something he's working on and an inspiring story again that we're gonna to listen to him and we're gonna get out of it. Thank you so much for being here. Most welcome. And we really appreciate it. And wish you the very best in your career and to many more. Thank you. Same to you and all the best. Appreciate Great stuff it. you're doing here. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. That has been Paul Kasimu, only on The Headhunter. Please stay tuned. We'd love to hear your feedback on our social media platforms. Please get in touch with us. And of course, don't go anywhere else. How do you get yourself on The Headhunter's list?